We're in our sixth week now of this uh, series that we started the new year off called New Tudes, the Beatitudes. And as we are looking at these uh, Beatitudes, these blessings uh, given by Jesus, they began his famous sermon known as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and as we're doing this, I think we're seeing Jesus give a new way of thinking, a new, uh, some new attitudes, a new way of thinking about people who are in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Jesus was always changing the way people thought throughout his lifetime, throughout his ministry especially. But I think here in this uh, Sermon on the Mount is where we began to see him do it in his teaching. And each beatitude uh, that he has given us has been countercultural. Uh, Terry can't stand it when I say that word, but it's been countercultural, uh, meaning that it went against what society thought or what the social norms were. And he continues that style of teaching today as we look at our sixth beatitude. Today we look at the pure in heart. Uh, this one may or may not be as countercultural as the other. Others we've looked at, but today we're going to really focus on this word pure here today, uh, which makes me think about some of the things in our world that we love or we think of as being pure. Uh, one of the pure things in this world that we love is pure gold. You know, gold is actually said to be beneficial for blood flow. Uh, it's said to help with inflammation and the immune system. And yes, I know that Valentine's Day is three days away, but this is not a plug for ladies to start asking for gold this week to help with their blood flow or their immune system or their inflammation. Uh, again, yes, nothing to do with Valentine's Day, but another pure thing we love are pure diamonds. A diamond. It's a pure substance because it is made up of carbon atoms only. Now, those are two expensive Pure substances that we have. But I want us to think about this one for just a second. Pure water. Did you know you cannot find 100% pure water anywhere in nature? Say you can take water from the best springs, the purest springs of lakes or rivers. You can analyze a sample and you would always find a small amount of dissolved minerals. Things like sodium and calcium and potassium and magnesium and chloride. And those would make the water impure. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad for us. It just has some types of minerals in it. So uh, drinking spring water and distilled water and things like that, they are good, they are healthy for us. But did you know that there is such a thing as ultra pure water? It has to be made by scientists. There's a process they go through to get rid of all the impurities in it. Uh, but here's the thing. Drinking too much ultra-pure water is not good for you. If you drink a glass of ultra-pure water, you'd be fine. But if you drink too much of it, it could actually kill you. The reason being that since ultra-pure water doesn't have all the minerals in it, the water, when you drink it, will instead pull those minerals from your body. Pure water acts as a sponge and it just soaks up things around it, meaning that if you drink nothing but the pure water that was made, then the water would in turn end up drinking you dry. You'd lose a lot of electrolytes, you'd lose the needed minerals in your body. Now, basically, pure water, uh, this is made for chemists and scientists to use in experiments. That's the only reason that it is really out there. You know, there are a lot of things that are pure in our world. Some of them are okay. Some of them are really good. Some of them not so good for you, even bad for you if you have too much. I have no idea that, that pure water could eventually suck you dry of all the good needed materials that you have in your body and ultimately kill you after time. Now, to me, when I think of the word pure, I don't think of anything like that. And obviously, that's not the type of pure Jesus is talking about here when we look at this next beatitude. In this beatitude, in Matthew 5, 8, Jesus said these words. He said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
This type of cure right here sounds so much better to me than having to spend a bunch of money on something pure. And it's certainly better than uh, drinking too much pure water that you end up killing yourself with it. What Jesus says here is something that actually makes sense. So let's look at today at what being pure in heart is. To do that, we're going to be going back and looking through a couple of sections in the Old Testament scriptures today. Uh, the reason for this is because being pure in heart, being pure is talked about in the Old Testament. And so the Hebrew people, the nation of Israel, they would have understood what Jesus was talking about when he talks about the pure in heart because it went along with their history. So let's take a little journey into the scriptures today. Just get a little bit better understanding of what Jesus was saying here. And as we do this, let's just pay attention to the verses, to the meaning of, the, of what's being said, to the feelings, to the emotions uh, that maybe you even end up having. And so to start off this journey, we're going to look at, of looking at pure, I want us to, I want to read some words from a commentary on Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, the verses we're looking at today. The reason I want to do that is because it's going to lead us into that next scripture that I want us to focus on. The commentary said this, Purity in heart refers to moral uprightness and not just ritual cleanliness. What Jesus requires of his disciples is a lifestyle characterized by pleasing God. The pure in heart exhibit a single-minded devotion to God that stems from the internal cleansing created by following Jesus. Holiness is a prerequisite for entering God's presence. The pure in heart pass this test, so they will see God and experience intimate fellowship with Him. This beatitude closely parallels Psalm 24, verses 3 through 4. So if you didn't guess from the end right there, the next verses I want us to look at come in Psalm chapter 23, verses 3, Psalm 24. It is Psalm 24, verses 3 through 4. This passage was mentioned in the commentary, so it has to be there for a good reason. Now, this is another one of David's psalms that we have that are written. And he wrote these words. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Now, tradition suggests that David wrote this psalm. Uh, after the return of the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. David declares here in this psalm God's role of creator and his role of being sovereign. He points out the need for worshipers of God to be sincere, to be truthful, to be righteous. This psalm calls out the city of Jerusalem to welcome the King of glory. But one of the main focuses of this psalm is that we need to be pure. This psalm reminds us of the idea of purity and seeing God in a very real way, as David puts it, standing in God's holy place. In these verses, we see that clean, clean hands are a part of a pure heart. And he's talking about washing our hands, or he's not, when he's talking about washing our clean hands, he's not talking about washing our hands with soap and water or using hand sanitizer, which are good things for us to still do, obviously. Having clean hands refers to us doing good religious deeds, avoidance, avoidance of doing evil deeds. Having a pure heart refers to a person's godly thoughts and character, even pointing out that the person who enters the Lord's presence in worship does not worship idols, David talks about. That would be anything or anyone other than the one true God. But there are many religious people, believe it or not, who believe that they truly cannot worship without being in a church building surrounded by religious symbols. Or they feel they have to repeat certain religious prayers or follow certain rituals that have been done for years. And so David's question here carries relevance for people today as well as for his original readers way back then. Who may stand in his holy place. David points out the need for worshipers of God to be sincere, to be truthful, to be righteous, to ultimately have a pure heart. You see, those who can stand in God's holy place, 
those who can stand in front of God are those who have pure hearts, pure motives, you could say, when they come to God. And this passage from Psalm 24 leads me to a couple of other verses where uh, we also read about talk of being pure and holy. I read recently that pure in heart is to be single in purpose, to have the single goal of accomplishing God's will for God's glory. Well, holy is mentioned as well in Psalm 24. To be holy means that we are set apart. We are set apart for God's use, for God's purpose. The idea is that when something is God's, it is not used for anything else or divided up for uh, to be used for anything else but God. Something that is dedicated to God is to be used for God only. And that's what makes it holy. It's set apart. That's what makes it pure. So I want to read a verse from the Old Testament again. Leviticus 20, verse 26. God says, Thus you are to be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. And I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. Now we can find other verses that are similar to this in Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, even in 1 Peter in the New Testament. But when something is holy and something is dedicated to God, it is God's and God alone. And so as believers, we belong to God. We are His. <coughs> now these words in Leviticus, from this verse, they are part of the law. That the Old Testament law, the old Mosaic law that God was giving to Moses for the nation of Israel to follow. God is speaking here in this section about remaining pure and holy. God was telling them that they were not to be like the other nations. Offering their children as sacrifices, turning to mediums and spiritists, which they did. He was talking about how they were not to be immoral people, but instead they should keep all of his laws and all of his commandments. And so God wanted them to be sure. He wanted to make sure that they were not going to follow the ways of the people who were living in this land before he gave it to the Israelites. And so after saying these things, God wanted to remind them that they are to be holy because he is holy. And God wanted them to understand that they were set apart. They were set apart from the evil people who were living there in that land before them. And they were to be his people. Now think about us today. <clears throat> and whether we are truly pure and holy before God. You know when we become a Christian. When, when we become a child of God. We are to be different. Right? Set apart from the rest of the world. And not just different from the world, but we are to be set apart for God's purpose, for God's use. If we're going to be a pure in heart person, then we need to be holy. And then I want to look, let's look at a verse in the New Testament. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 7, it says, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. In this section, Paul was writing really about sexual impurity. And how God certainly did not call us to be impure in that way. But he also didn't call us to be impure in other ways either. Instead, God has called us, as it says here, to live a holy life. And in doing so, let's be reminded of this. We do not become Christians. We don't become followers of Jesus or disciples of Jesus just so God can save us from our sins and save us from hell. That's part of it. That God delivers us from our sins also so that we can live a holy life. So that we can be pure, set apart for God's use to do His good works. The process through which He makes us holy is something called sanctification. Which is the action of process of being freed from sin. It involves a partnership really. God works in us to make us holy. See, the Christian life is not a passive life. We don't just say, I'm going to become a Christian and then just do nothing. The Christian life is not a passive life. It's an active life. It's one in which God and his people are partners, you could say. If we want to be pure in heart, then we as holy people must be active. 
But you know what I think makes this so difficult? I think one thing that makes this so challenging for many is the feeling of inadequacy. If someone has feelings of inadequacy, they feel like maybe they don't have the qualities or they don't have the abilities necessary to do something or to cope with life in general. Think about some of the words we've looked at today. David talked about being worthy to ascend the mountain of the Lord, to stand in his holy place. I don't know about you, but I think that can bring a feeling of inadequacy to some. People start thinking about who they are, or they start thinking about who they have been in the past, and they wonder, are they really worthy to stand in God's holy place? They begin to wonder if they are worthy even sometimes to go to God in prayer. And I think these are real thoughts and these are real difficulties that people go through in life. Because we know we are broken. We know we're imperfect. We know we're sinners. And knowing this, sometimes that little thought of inadequacy will creep into the minds of people. And they begin to think they're not good enough for God. The question becomes, why would God love me? Or can God sure really love me enough to forget about my faults? And then the way our brain works is that we just start letting our brain travel all over the place and tell us we aren't worthy to stand in front of God. When I think of pure and what Jesus is saying, I think of something that is constant. I think of something that doesn't change. And yet, when we have feelings of inadequacy, our brains instead are all over the place. But the one place our brains have a hard time really stopping, that is in front of, when we are feeling inadequate, is stopping in front of God. Those feelings are there for people. They don't have to be. Because we know what God has done for us. We know of His love, His mercy, His grace, the forgiveness that God has for His creation. Remember, God has called us to live holy lives. But he never called us to be holy and do it on our own. See, we're constantly in partnership, really, with God as we go through this. We have to rely on God. That is, if we allow God to be part of this. See, when we're pure in heart, we're set apart. We have God as the number one priority. Set apart for God's use. But you know where I think sometimes the feeling of inadequacy can come from? So often it just comes from us. It comes from ourselves in some ways. Because we try our best to mix in as much of the world as we can so that we can still live our lives the way we want to. And when we do that, it becomes extremely difficult, if not impossible, to be fully devoted, set apart, and pure for God. We'll let personal feelings or beliefs get in the way of how we interpret the Bible. That way we can still get what we want and say we love God, but it's not right. We spend our time doing all sorts of other things. We easily find time to do the other things. But when it comes to God, He often takes the back seat and gets our leftovers. But we get what we want and we still say we love God, but it's not right. We let our own views on political issues or moral issues take place of what God's Word says sometimes, even though God's Word may be clear on it. But we still get to think the way we want, and then we still say we love God and His Word, but it's not right. See, we let personal feelings or close relationships come between us and God. We say our family is more important. Family is very important, but when we do this, we end up pushing God to the side, which is not right. See, you can go on and on with the different things we try to mix into our everyday lives that become more important to us. But you see, the feelings of inadequacy, the feelings that God doesn't love me, and all that comes from within ourselves when we choose to set God aside and rely on something else. And when we do that, 
Are we truly being people who are pure in heart? People who are holy, set apart for God's use. See, when we do these things, and it's so easy to do them, but when we do these things, we end up making ourselves impure. We end up in a mess. We end up drifting away from God. And it happens so fast. And we ultimately end up being this, a pretender. We try to make ourselves look good and right. But on the inside, God knows exactly who we are. And to be honest, most of the people in our lives know as well. It's like a product that I read about recently that came out 30, oh, about 20 years ago. It was called Spray-On Mud. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. This was a product for people who had off-road vehicles, but they didn't want to take them off-road. In 2005, Spray-On Mud came in a can, and it was available to off-road vehicles in what they called wannabe, it, 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 off-road wannabes in the UK. As recent as 2014, it was making its rounds in Australia. I don't know if this product ever made it to America or if you can even still buy this or not, but what was the purpose of this product? Ultimately, the product, the purpose of the product was to make you appear to be someone you are not. You sprayed it on your Jeep or your off-road vehicle. You could have the appearance of owning a Jeep and taking it out in the mud while never actually doing it. If you didn't want to take the chance of damaging your vehicle in any way, you just buy some spray-on mud, apply it to your vehicle, and simple solution. But think about this. Is that what we do as Christians sometimes? Do we go through much of life, and instead of being pure in heart, instead of being holy, set apart for God's use, we become a pretender. We look the part on the outside. But what does our inside say about us? That's why Jesus had such a problem during his ministry with the Pharisees and the religious leaders. They tried, they followed the rules as best as they could, but their hearts were constantly in the wrong place. And if that's us in any way, then let's ask ourselves this question as we finish up. How do we pursue being pure in heart? We do this quickly. Because we want to be pure in heart, right? We want to see God. We want to feel like we can ascend to his holy hill and come before him. We want to be in God's presence. We want God to take care of us. But who are the ones that see God, according to Jesus? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's the pure in heart. So if we want to pursue God, I think we, we could start with that feeling of inadequacy. And I think it goes back to our first two Beatitudes, really. I've said all along that these Beatitudes really connect together. See, in the first Beatitude, it was the poor in spirit who are blessed. The poor in the spirit are those people who recognize that they are sinful, they are imperfect, but they need God. When the second Beatitude, it said that those blessed are those who mourn. Now, it was those who mourn who were mourning over their sin. You see, if we want to pursue being pure in heart, we do what we've really looked at over this series. But it starts with acknowledging who we are as sinners and mourning over those sins before God. We can't do it on our own. We go to God with our impurities. Are you worthy? Not on your own. But the things that separate us from God and being worthy, the things that separate us from God and being worthy is exactly what Jesus came to suffer and die on the cross for. So as we conclude, we are messy because of our sins. No other way around that. And because of that, we need to have a great desire to become pure in heart. Because those who are pure in heart are blessed and they shall see God. We need to have a great desire to be holy, to be set apart for God's purpose, for God's use. And so our challenge today is to move towards 
more purity in heart to accept the purity that only God can give. We're going to sing a hymn invitation here in just a minute. And you know, we talked about ultra pure water. We talked about how damaging that can be if you have too much of it. But you know, it's interesting how God used water in the scriptures in different ways. You know, with the Red Sea, God used the water to part the waters so that the Israelites could walk through on dry ground and be free. The Jordan River, when it was time to go take over the land of Canaan, God spread the waters apart and the Israelites were able to walk through. And then God gave us a way to where we could become pure in life. To be immersed in the waters of baptism that were sins taken away from us. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you've never confessed Him before others and repented, if you've never been immersed in the waters of baptism to have your sins washed away, you have that opportunity to do that. Let's make it happen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing our hymn invitation here this morning. It'll be song number 208 in your hymn books. The first and last verses of Let Jesus Come Into Your Heart. <clears throat>